Welcome. This is an overview of classical and neoclassical organization theory. Please note that there is a long line of trajectory of research in classical and neoclassical organization theory. I can't uh, possibly cover all of the thinkers within these two respective fields, but I would encourage students to continue reading to get a better sense of uh, all of the work that's been done in uh, these two fields. Today, I'm basically going to expose you to some of the key thinkers, especially as they relate to what currently goes on in educational settings. First, the definition of a working definition, I should say, of organizations. Organizations may be defined as associations of several to many people who are attempting to fulfill a common goal. A number of scholars have elaborated on this basic working definition. The basic definition would suggest, therefore, that organization theory has deep roots even into ancient times. However, <clears throat> most organizational theorists view the beginning of industrialization in the factory system as the beginning of economic organizations and the beginning of the field of organization theory. So let's begin with uh, classical organization theory. It's important to note that understanding classical organization theory isn't important just for its historic value. Current theories of organizations directly and indirectly point to classical theory and educational organizations continue to be influenced by this theory. Many scholars in the field of education claim that this anchor to this theory is a major reason why schools are not keeping pace with changes in society. Yet, you know, these critiques are not limited only to schools. Lately, as we've, no as we've been noting, schools are taking a very big hit in the media. But the reality is that connection to classical theory uh, is a connection that happens sort of across spheres, not just in schools. Classical organization theory emerged from the early 1900s to 1930. Classical theory is a wide field that's comprised of the merging of three respective fields, scientific management, bureaucratic theory, and administrative theory. Important pioneers of this theory included Frederick Winslow Taylor, Henry Fayol, Max Weber, and Mary Parker Follett. Before looking at the work of each, let's look at the major assumptions of classical organization theory as a whole. One of the assumptions is that there's one best way to perform tasks in the organization. And the way to find the best way is through systematic and scientific inquiry. Second, formal communication processes between employees and management must be in place. You avoid conflict by defining tasks, defining accountability, in formalizing all procedures. Specialization and division of labor is key. Third, people and organizations act in accordance with rational economic principles. Workers are motivated by means of money. Of course, we know that uh, we can only see how the, the, this uh, particular theory is problematic in education where you know, a lot of recent research points to the fact that uh, teachers, I mean, a lot of this doesn't apply to teachers in schools. Uh, teachers uh, are, for the most part, motivated by, um, by matters more than, than money. Fourth, workers are considered as a product of means of production or as a cog in the wheel. The applicable metaphor we can use to think about this theory is that of a machine, efficient, hierarchical, highly centralized, planning oriented, highly regulated, and tightly controlled. It's important to note before we move on, the historical context of the work of theorists within this field. The railroad industry was under increased attention in the press for increased rates and it was a period characterized by widespread labor unrest. Taylor, for example, was responding to the needs of the time. Also, in the late 1800s to about 1920, 
three major changes in the United States that demanded changes in informal and individualistic approaches to social organization. The population of cities rose as a result of European immigration. Large rural populations shifted to cities due to declining agricultural work. Large factories arose. The work of these classical theorists should not be dismissed as simplistic. It's too easy for us to lo look at uh, these theories from our historical, our, our current context, and, and view them as simplistic. They were pioneers of their historical context, and their theories were successful to a great extent, given the complexity of the organizations and the time in which they were designed. Let's look at um, some of the major theorists. First, there is Frederick Winslow Taylor. He's known as the father of scientific management. Taylor pioneered the development of time and motion studies, which involved breaking down complex tasks into simple steps. The sequence of movements in those small steps is carefully observed in the effort to eliminate wasteful motions. The precise time taken for each correct movement is measured. From these measurements, production and delivery times and prices can be computed and incentive schemes can be devised. He believed in closely matching each worker to each task. Taylor's underlying assumption was that the majority of workers put minimal effort into their work if they know they can easily get away with it. He referred to this behavior as soldiering. For Taylor, the lack of productivity in an organization is tied to the lowest level of the organization, that is, with what workers do or don't do. Taylor believed that workers should be closely supervised and rewards and punishment should be utilized as motivational tools. Many of Taylor's concepts and theories are still in use today. One can sense Taylor's influence in organizational structures where what matters most is production. The people who actually do the work in organizations are a second thought. Organizational pride in the effect that workers have towards their labor are not as seriously considered, nor are workers seen as professionals capable of collectively determining the most effective methods of organizing the work environment. A great deal of the principles centered in No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top are built off of Taylorism. Of course, the United States has a stronger tradition of local school control than many nations, so the manner in which these policies are articulated and implemented in different states and local contexts differ. The use of scripted curricula in education, for example, can be traced to Taylorism. The legacy of scientific management is substantial in education and across spheres. Other theorists of scientific management expanded on Taylor's work. For example, Lillian Gilbreth, one of the first female engineers and a person deeply interested in education. She actually wrote her dissertation on efficient teaching methods, and her husband Frank were important in this regard. I would encourage you to continue reading or to, to research the work of Lillian Gilbreth. The main argument against Taylor is this reductionist approach to work, is that the reductionist approach to work dehumanizes the worker. There's no room for the individual worker to excel or think. Its application in education has been referred as an effort to de-skill teachers. Max Weber, unlike Taylor who focused more heavily on the individual worker, Weber focused on the organization as a whole his theory of bureaucracy, first published in 1922, is the most influential statement on bureaucracy and the point of departure for all further work on the subject. Weber emphasized the need and importance of hierarchical structure and power in a formal set of rules to standardize the organization. His work expands on Taylor's work in the sense that he does not dismiss division of labor and task specialization. Educational leaders of the time quickly took to implement bureaucratic patterns in schools. This continues to have tremendous significance on schools today. Examples include 
grouping students of similar ages and level in the same classroom. Uncommon, this was uncommon in the early 19th century, of course. Differentiating teachers by the grade they teach or the subjects they teach at the secondary level. Establishment of a hierarchy, key, a hierarchy of administrative offices, superintendent on down. Explicit rules about the functioning of each job beyond licensure requirements. The focus on developing technical knowledge regarding the job. The fixation on standardized testing data and documentation. Examples, uh, a big example in schools right now is the, the structure of RTI or response through intervention, largely modeled after the work of the classical theorists. Next is Henry Fayol. He developed the first comprehensive theory of management. So he would be considered among the administrative theorists in classical organizational theory. If you recall, there were three uh, aspects. There was the scientific management connected to Taylor. You have the bureaucratic theory connected to Weber. And then you have the administrative theory, which would be connected to folks like Fayol. He believed that his concept of management was universally applicable to all types of organizations. He defined five management functions, planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating, and controlling. He outlined 14 managerial principles in line with the major assumptions of classical organization, organizational theory outlined earlier. So I would encourage students to review the 14 principles by typing FAYOL's 14 principles of management after this presentation on any search engine. I'm not going to go over it here uh, because, again, I, I reviewed uh, sort of the key themes of classical organization theory, and he doesn't stray too far from those themes. But it's important to know these 14 managerial principles nonetheless. I would, I would definitely review it. Highly prescriptive. Uh, again, the, the notion that it's universal across all organizations is important to keep in mind. So some criticisms of classical organization theory. First of all, it's very rigid and mechanistic. It assumes that people are motivated to work simply out of considerations of economic reward. Uh, of course, strong bureaucratic controls places a big limit on individual discretion, which runs counter to the American ideal of individualism, interestingly. So in a lot of organizations, you have this tension, right? So American ideal of individualism in highly tight bureaucratic controls. The emphasis on technical issues, rules, hierarchical reporting structures, strict specialization, and so on does not satisfy the human need for belonging and community. Many educational scholars would claim that schools are more complex than what traditional bureaucratic theory would suggest. For these scholars, the fact that they're modeled largely on classical theories is what makes them alienating places. Later on in the class, um, I'll also expose um, some theorists who sort of defend uh, some aspects of bureaucracy, and I think that that's important to note as well. Okay? Neoclassical organization theory is also referred to as the human relations movement. As the name suggests, it's a theory that arose out of critique to the lack of humaneness of people within organizations structured on the principles of classical theory. There are two reasons why classical theory remains so powerful in schools today, despite neoclassical critiques. First, neoclassical theory did not develop a comprehensive theory of its own, but rather borrowed from many fields. Institutions in search of concrete principles are therefore more drawn to the prescriptiveness of classical theory. In other words, classical theory is more likely to answer the question, what do I do on Monday? And, and neoclassical theory had more difficulty in sort of situating um, sort of that common sense um, type of discourse. Second, 
Neoclassical the theory did not attach itself to the notion that it was universally applicable and it was more theoretical rather than based on empirical investigation. Despite these limitations, neoclassical theory contributed extensively to organizational theory. Most modern theories of organizations build off of neoclassical theory. Some important neoclassical theorists include Elton Mayo, Chester Bernard, and Herbert Simon. Let's look at each of their work briefly, and from this overview, you should get a good sense of the general trajectory of this school of organizational thought. So Elton Mayo. Mayo and colleagues conducted a series of experiments at Hawthorne Works, which was a Western electric factory outside Chicago. The objective was to study if workers would be more productive depending on the intensity of light in the factory. The workers' productivity seemed to increase when changes in lighting were made. The findings of the study basically claimed that workers' motivation increased because an interest was being shown in them and their well-being. Subsequent studies on different interventions yielded the same findings. It's important to note here that, that um, some theorists actually pointed out major flaws in Mayo's studies. Um, and so, well, we won't get into that here for the space because of time, but uh, down, the lo down, down the line, hopefully, you'll, uh, you'll be able to read about some of these critiques in the different readings that I assign. Mayo also found that solidarity among the work group increased satisfaction with the work. He felt that the formal organization, i.e. management, should therefore use this knowledge in the effort to control the workplace, although he did not use the term control explicitly. Harry Braverman, in a seminal book called Labor and Monopoly Capital, The Degradation of Work in the 20th Century, brought heavy critique to these experiments and saw them as efforts to control and de-skill workers. Braverman also documented worker resistance, resistance due to these studies. Despite this critique and the various critiques that followed, Mayo's work challenged the classical theorists by demonstrating that other social aspects of the organization were also important in maintaining motivation. Next, we have Chester Bernard. In The Functions of the Executive, written in 1938, Bernard sought to create a comprehensive theory of behavior in formal organizations that centered on cooperation. He felt that cooperation was important to an organization. The executive's responsibility was to create a sense of purpose, a moral code, ethical visions, and so on. The executive had to also create systems of formal and informal communication and to attempt to create structures for people to cooperate. People, according to Bernard, are to be induced to co cooperate. So it should be clear that in both classical and neoclassical organization theory, conflict has no place in the organization. Later, contingency theory will arise to address the notion of conflict in organizations, and we have other theories that also address conflict um, all the way to Marxist uh, and neo-Marxist theories. Next, we have Herbert Simon. He critiqued classical organizational theory as inapplicable to many of the administrative situation, situations facing managers. So he's known for taking um, the current situations of his time and, and demonstrating that you know, classical organizational theory just doesn't fit. He tried to show contradictions in the work of Fayol as applied to organizations and concluded that they were not principles at all, but rather proverbs of administration. So what were the major contributions of neoclassical theory? Okay, so let's go over the contributions once again to wrap up um, this particular school. Bowman and Deal in 1997 highlight major assumptions of the theory, which of course also serves as contributions. So Bowman and Deal point out that, uh, one, organizations exist to serve human needs rather than the reverse. This assumption was more pronounced 
after the introduction of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs into organizational theory. Second contribution is that they contributed this idea that people and organizations need each other, and when the fit between individual and system is poor, both suffer. In a good fit, profits both the individual and the organization. Other, contribu other contributions include that um, organizations cannot exist independently and isolated from their environments. Neoclassical theory opened up the door for later sociological studies. Also, um, another contribution was that organizations are not simply rational. They also exhibit non-rational aspects. Neoclassical theory opened up the door for an explosion of studies in theory on organizations, including the human relations approach, modern structural systems approach, power and politics approach, and cultural perspectives of organizations. So, understanding classical and neoclassical organizational theory is critical for educational leaders. Schools are shaped largely by classical organizational theory, but there is often tension between the two. For example, let me give you one example. A school may claim that it practices site-based management, meaning that teachers make decisions. Yet teachers at the school may complain that too much of their time is taken up deciding minor issues like how much time students should spend in transition in the hallways, the time that these issues take up minimize the time that they may be spent in preparation for teaching. Despite the appeal to neoclassical theory in addressing the human need to control one's work, classical theory still rules the organization since the hierarchical structure determines that most important decisions are made at the top. All right, so the most important decisions in the schools in the school are made by the administration and teachers are sort of put into these sort of t uh, team type atmospheres but they really get to decide only the small issues, small mundane issues. So understanding these tensions is critical to the creation of more responsive organizations capable of addressing the needs of modern society. Understanding these theories will help us understand how they are too often recycled and promoted as innovative. Too often this has uh, detrimental effects on schools and ultimately the lives of youth.